I want to start with a question. Can you raise your hand for me if you work with some amount of legacy code, like ever? For the people whose hands aren't up, is, has your country, yeah, your company existed for more than like three days? Like, yeah, so like most of us deal with some amount of legacy code. We, we work at a company that's existed for more than a week. But if you don't by chance, the cool thing is the code we're writing today, that's the legacy code of tomorrow. So don't worry, you will if you don't quite yet. And it's really easy to hate on legacy code because you stumble through some old piece of something and you can't believe it. It uses some framework that came over on the Mayflower, and you're like, what were these people thinking? But the other interesting thing about that code is that's the code that got us and our companies where we are today. And oftentimes it just works, like we haven't touched it because we haven't needed to, so that's, that's not all bad. Inevitably though, we, we find ourselves at this place where the code that got us where we are can't get us where we're going. And then comes everybody's favorite task. We get to update some piece of legacy code that's running in production that our customers expect to work. Who here has pushed a change that caused an outage? Yeah. Oh, the people who have, don't have their hand up, congratulations. Don't worry, you will, uh, I promise. It's incredibly stressful when you take down something that like, I don't know, people are using. That's the risk I wanna talk about today because you know, we as engineers, when we're working on something and we have this like, I don't know, intrinsic fear, maybe it's just me, of taking down production, that doesn't help us do our best work, but when we can mitigate that risk and we understand the tools at our disposal to help us in the inevitable chance that we break it, we're gonna do better work. All right, I've seen a fair bit of legacy code in my career. Before I was a senior staff engineer at Carta, I was, I was at Yahoo, also I was at Verizon. So think about Verizon. That is a company that has functionally existed since the invention of the telephone and so to say they had, yeah, when I wrote this joke, there, there was like six people are gonna get it. Thank you, uh, I liked it, that's just me. My husband helped, he's not here. Um, they had a fair bit of legacy code, they've been around for a while. Carta is not nearly as old as Verizon, we're only a little bit more than a dozen years old, but we have our own share of legacy code too. And when it comes time to do these upgrades, we have a few different choices. We can rewrite the code in place, we can do the one that gives me the most anxiety, which is stand up the new thing and then one morning switch over all the traffic and pray. Or we can gradually replace that code over time using something like the strangler fig pattern. So what I wanna walk you through today is a, a real life example of a legacy code update that we did at Carta using the strangler fig pattern. And I wanna take you through that with this lens of risk mitigation. Now, if you're familiar with this pattern and you were listening this morning, you're like, didn't, isn't Strangler Fig from like the late Jurassic? This is not exactly the bleeding edge of technology. You're not wrong. Martin Fowler's blog about this came out in 2004. And I said this to a friend of mine and he's like, there are gonna be people at this conference who don't remember 2004. And I was fine. Um, but if you do remember 2004, maybe you remember that is the year that Facebook came out as the Facebook. Lord of the Rings, Return of the King won best picture. We got the Nintendo DS and then The Incredibles in the United States. This wasn't exactly last week. But I would argue that this pattern actually gets more useful with time because we're, we keep writing code, right? And that means we keep making legacy code, right? So tools in our toolbox that help us mitigate risk when we have to do these inevitable upgrades, these are really important. So. Often you hear strangler fig in relationship to decomposition. Spoiler alert, I'm gonna talk about decomposition. But that's not actually, I think, the most interesting part of the strangler fig pattern. It's good for that, no question. The thing I love about the strangler fig pattern is that it gives our engineers a safety net. When we feel that, you're gonna hear me say this several times, uh, it's because I really like it. When we have that feeling of safety, we write better code and we serve our customers better. Maybe you though, you haven't heard of this pattern and I don't blame you. I had probably only come across it like five or six years ago. The strangler fig pattern is named after a real plant called the strangler fig, uh, if you hadn't guessed. And it's this, it's this viney thing. Underneath there is a tree. I know this isn't like the best picture in the universe, but there aren't strangler figs where I live. Um, there's a tree underneath there. And th what happens with these plants is they start at the tops of the trees and they slowly grow down into the soil. Eventually they actually kill the underlying tree. They're a parasite. And the strangler fig now replaces the tree that used to be there. 
The strangler fig pattern is trying to do basically exactly the same thing. We want to replace our legacy system by incrementally increasing the functionality of our new system until one day our old system doesn't exist anymore and it's been entirely replaced by the new one. Let me walk you through the really high level principles that come along with this pattern and then I promise we really are gonna look at a, a real use case. When you're using this pattern, the first thing you typically do is write what the pattern calls a facade. I'll often call it a proxy. It's basically a piece of software that lets you decide for this given piece of traffic, should it go to the legacy system or the new system? And when you first stand up your facade, it's gonna be super boring because your new system doesn't do anything. All of your traffic is gonna to go to your legacy system. The next thing you're gonna do is, is tease out these individual modules that you can independently migrate in your legacy system. This part, in my opinion, typically is much more of an art than a science. You have to figure out what are the individual pieces that I can reliably move independently without destroying the world. And then you start moving them. So I wanna point out module one and module two are in this like, I don't know, hash mark situation over here. They still exist in the legacy system. We're not actually touching that implementation at all. But now our new system also supports the behavior of module one and module two. So our facade, when it gets a piece of traffic, it's been informed, okay, is this traffic using module one? Cool, send that to the new system. Oh, it's using module N? Okay, no, send that, send that to the legacy system because the new system doesn't know how to handle that yet. And eventually, after you move these things one at a time, you don't have anything in your legacy system anymore. And you can decommission it, delete your facade, probably have cake, and you've done, you've done the full legacy migration to your new system. The facade is the thing about the strangler fig pattern that I am absolutely obsessed with because that is the thing that gives us this safety net. When we inevitably introduce some bug into our new system, and we will, we don't have to like fix it immediately in order to mitigate it for our customers. We can switch them back to the legacy system because we haven't touched that. When you can do that and you know exactly what you need to do when you break it, that gives you this incredible freedom to actually like innovate in your new system. Okay, cool. It's fun to talk about like things that don't exist. I wanna walk you through a real time that we actually changed the underlying implementation for an active running system in Carta and I'm gonna talk about it in relationship to HR systems. And you're like, why in the world does Carta give a hoot about HR systems? I'm gonna explain it very briefly because it's, uh, you, that's not what you came here for. But if you're not familiar with Carta, one of our business lines is we manage like cap tables for private companies. And when you're a private company and you hire new people or you terminate people, that impacts your cap table. So you could come into Carta and like manually manage that through our, our, we call it a stakeholder management module, but you've already informed your HR system of those changes. So we integrate with your HR system to make that stakeholder management more automated than it would be otherwise. Okay, cool. We'd done this actually for a really long time and it was running in our monolith and it was running pretty well for many years. But you know how I said at the top, sometimes the code that got you where you are can't get you where you go, you're going. And this was like mid 2021 that we found that was exactly where we are. That HR integration support can't get us into this new business line that we wanna support around a compensation product. A compensation product cares about who your employees are, but unfortunately the existing implementation couldn't be extended to this new business line. And I'm gonna explain this more later. We also just generally had, this code was, had been around long enough untouched, we were generally lacking a lot of expertise in how it worked anymore. And the team of us that was responsible for fixing it had literally never worked in that code base at all. So let me show you how it started. I'm gonna use my laser pointer, I'm very excited. We're gonna see how it works. Okay, cool. Um, this is the stakeholder management module I was talking about. Um, and when you look at this picture, it's not like wildly unreasonable to just look, it seems kind of okay. This integration management UI I point out only because it exists not that it's very interesting in this use case. Um, but we, we wanna introduce this new compensation product, right? And that seems fine, except for the part where that product was only gonna work for some of our HR providers. So we got <laughs> these, these, this, these were, this is a real thing that happened. You ended up in a conversation with a customer who was like interested in this compensation product we were thinking about rolling out. 
And we have to say, yeah, well, we support your HR provider, just like not like that. And when you say that out loud, it sounds bananas. Um, that's because it was. So we, ha we had to do something about this. And it, I have this nice box around the HR integrations, like it was you know, some unified module that worked together. It had grown organically over many years. So really, really it was more like this. I show three, there's actually way more than this. Um, and don't get hung up on these names because I didn't bother to go look and see what was actually in the monolith at the time. I was just like, those are definitely HR provider names um, that are on our website, so I'm not like lying. So uh, we have these like independent things that are consuming HR data in such a way that we can support stakeholder, I'm gonna try this one more time. We can support stakeholder management, but this guy is like out to lunch except for on alternating Tuesdays. Okay, what are we gonna do? Well, we weren't gonna touch that because it was way too scary. We, we had a very small amount of confidence that we could really rewrite this in place and not destroy the whole world and have it do the right thing. So instead, we came up with like a brand new, I'm not gonna walk you through all of this, just like it's different, right? You can tell that it's different. There's a message bus in the middle. Um, the, the two big differences were that we wanted to move to something event-driven, hence the message bus, and we wanted to move out of the monolith because we wanted to be able to move more quickly. And this was a very exciting idea, but is pretty far away from where we started. And the other thing that was really important, if we were gonna do this decomposition, we had to make sure that we fixed that consistent data contract problem because we did not just wanna recreate our existing issue and a new system. You don't make anything better when you do that. Okay, where, if this is where you wanna go and you saw where we started, what did we do first? I'm gonna talk this whole time about how we were really focused on risk mitigation because we were really focused on risk mitigation. And the first thing we did was we, standed, we stood up this new, we standed, we stood up this new service that was connected to literally nothing and had no functionality at all. And we did that because you can't break anything in a system that nobody knows exists. We had not done a lot of work in deploying new services in our infrastructure, so we decided we were gonna do that first and make sure that we you know, knew what we were doing. The one piece we did put in there was a layer of provider abstraction, because that was gonna be the thing that ensured we maintained a consistent data contract. But this alone does literally nothing interesting. And I said we use Strangler Fig, right? So, and I also said the first thing we did was you do is your facade, so I only lied to you a little bit, because the second thing we did was our facade. And we didn't build something new. Some, it's very common that you do have to introduce a new layer when you need this facade. We decided to repurpose our existing APIs and make them the facade or proxy, whichever word you like. And when you think about like traffic routing and stuff, it sounds complicated when you say, I need this thing that routes the traffic. So I wanna show you how this actually played out in our code in practice. Um, and these are the only two slides that I use ChatGPT for in this talk, but it did a good, relatively good job. I asked it for uh, what a plausible function, because I wasn't gonna actually put our source code up here because it's actually too complicated. It wasn't that interesting anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, let's pretend that this is a pre-facade implementation of our code that fetches a customer's HR integrations, right? So not only do we need to consume your data, but you have to be able to manage, like today I, talk to Rippling, but I just moved to Workday or something. Let's pretend this is the code that tells us, you know, what your existing HR integrations are. It's pretty simple, right? Get the customer by the ID that came in, do a little bit of error handling, and then call some function that knows how to package this data and return it back uh, on the response. All right, now we want this layer to be our facade. How much does it have to change? Like not very much at all is how much it has to change. What, so what do we do here? We added a new, ch the beginning part outside of the green box is literally exactly the same. Uh, please believe me, that's true. In the green box, the first thing we did is add a check into the database for this new flag that we created that's like, is this customer configured to use the new service? Cool. If it is, call some new function that knows how to interface with the new service, package that data and return it. Are you not configured to use the new service? Great, just call the function you called all the time. So the totality of our facade changes were like three lines of code. And this is a tiny bit of oversimplification, but I think in reality it might've been like six lines of code. So it really was, it was not complicated. It's actually better if it's not complicated. Okay, now we have a facade that can direct traffic to something that doesn't do anything and literally nobody is configured to use. 
So now we need to find those independent modules. The nice thing for us, sometimes this is really hard, finding these independent modules. The nice thing for us was it was really, really easy. Those HR providers, the implementation that existed today were basically already independent modules. So we just picked one. And because we were so focused on risk mitigation, you know, picking your first thing to move doesn't necessarily have a single right answer. We chose the provider that had the fewest customers because that's how you upset the fewest people is if you use the thing that has the smallest footprint. We didn't actually change, again, anything about the legacy implementation of this provider. We just introduced the functionality in our new service. So now, once this was done, we could have a customer running either on the new service or the, new, the old service that was using this first provider that we implemented. We did a bunch of testing in our non-prod environment, and then I was like, let's turn it on. Like, let's, let's see what happens. I'm gonna talk about like tooling to make this easier in a second. We had none of that to start. We just wanted to fail really fast. So we sent some cookies to our DBAs and said, would you please run these, these queries in production? And they were like, are you sure? And we're like, yeah, we think so. And I waited for something to explode when we moved our first customer. No one was as surprised as I was that it just worked. <laughs> um, we actually never had to move that initial customer back to the legacy system. Did we pick a customer that had the fewest employees? We sure did. And the least interesting data? Absolutely yes. But it made the team feel really great that we got one customer moved. Like, yeah, we only had a zillion to go, but cool, one was infinitely more than anyone had ever accomplished ever. But you, you're probably like, yeah, you said that risk mitigation thing, and then you were also running manual database queries in production, because those don't sound the same. That is correct. Manual database queries in production, I think the technical term are fraught with peril. So we built ourselves some tooling. In my experience, sometimes like this customer migration tooling, it can be a little bit controversial when you're talking about folks about needing to do these kinds of migrations, because they're like, isn't this just throwaway work? Like, once all of these customers are migrated, you're just gonna delete this tool. They're not wrong. But when you are doing this type of gradual migration from some old service to a new one, you need some tooling to manage how your facade routes data. And it doesn't have to be a nice UI, but boy, it's pretty great if it is, because you can just look at the tool and understand exactly what's going on. You can also use feature flags or system settings. There's no real one right answer to how to do that sort of tooling, but it's, it basically has to exist. The other reason I wanna call out this tooling in particular is that the granularity of your facade routing is a really important part of when you're building the safety net of understanding how you're gonna mitigate risk. We talked about at the beginning of this whole migration. Maybe we're just gonna move all of the customers on a single provider at the same time. Like, you know, we'll have the provider stood up and we'll move everybody. And then I like played this out in my head where 90% of them break and I crash Slack because of all of the notifications that some things are broken and I can't sort out the errors from the success. Yeah, it devolved in my brain very quick. I, I'm an eternal pessimist, but I was probably not entirely wrong. So we instead decided to move individual customers. And that let us move somebody and wait and see if anything blew up before we had to move somebody else. But we also built another tool. This tool let us decide, so that's, it's one thing to like migrate the customers who exist today, right? But also this is a live active running system. I've got new people coming in right now, hooking up their HR provider. So how do I decide if they move into the new system or not? This was where we decided that we were gonna let that go at the individual provider level. And I wanted to call this out in particular because when you're thinking about risk mitigation, you need to understand the risk profiles of your different use cases to make sure that you're routing that traffic correctly. Our risk profile for like new customers who had no expectations of what this tool was probably gonna do, we were more willing to accept risk with them than we were with our customers who like used these tools every day and if we broke them, they would probably call someone who would then come be unhappy with us. There's no one right answer to this, but it's an important consideration when you're thinking about how you're gonna route your traffic and your facade. Okay, cool. So does that mean I'm actively creating data in a thing I'm trying to delete? A little bit, yes. Um, almost certainly you're going to be in that situation when you're doing these sorts of incremental migrations. 
this was another thing that was very controversial. In engineering, we were like, well, we have the tooling that eventually we will be able to move everybody. So we're okay with this. We're okay with some amount of customers functionally creating their own tech debt. Our product partners were, but like this new system is like faster, fast, fast, faster and shinier, and I want more customers on that more quickly. And it was a conversation, and it was a discussion of trade-offs. We did not feel in engineering that we could effectively move all new integrations to the new service at one time, and manage the inevitable errors that would arise. And sometimes that is a trade-off worth making, but it is something that you often have to have in conversation with, with like your your other teams. Cool, so now we can move customers into the new service and we can implement new providers and we can have folks create integrations in the new service. So it must just be like turn the crank and we migrated everyone and everyone clapped. Not exactly. So it was, this was huge progress, but I've, only, I've talked about like getting new integrations into the service and migrating existing customers. But did you notice I didn't talk at all about getting data out of the thing? There's also some complexity there. So like backwards compatibility is really important. I need these tools to keep working. I also mentioned that we used our API layer as our facade. This red circle is intended to denote the lack of an arrow. Our stakeholder management tool didn't actually use the APIs that powered other projects uh, for hashtag reasons. It was making direct database calls into the monolith database which didn't have this new data in it because we hadn't given it any way to do so. So we had to make some decisions. What were we gonna do? The thing I really wanted to do, I wanted to make that arrow exist. I wanted to go into the stakeholder management tool. Yeah, I, you can see where I'm going. That's not what we did. Um, I wanted to go into the stakeholder management tool and like encapsulate the functionality that fetched the HR data just, you know, cool, right now it calls the, the database directly. I'm going to be able to change that once it's encapsulated to instead call the APIs, and it's going to work great. Until we actually started, like, looking at the details. Also, the folks on this team, we had literally no idea how the stakeholder management tool worked. And as we dug into the details, in the interest of risk mitigation, we were like, rewriting this thing is probably, probably a mistake. So if that's not the thing we're going to do, how do we get data to this system? This arrow is like glossing over probably 10,000 not super interesting details, but just in the interest of my being able to sleep tonight, the new service doesn't actually just acquire a database connection to the monolith because something about that feels wrong to me, but the data flow is effectively correct. Um, we decided instead of making the stakeholder management tool use the APIs, we were gonna have our new service get its data into the database where the stakeholder management tool expected it as if it had never changed, so that it didn't have to know the difference. We like we did a, a presto change-o on the stakeholder management tool. So we never had to change its implementation of anything, but the data from our new service was available for it to read. Backwards compatibility when you're doing these sorts of changes, sometimes your facade alone is sufficient. Sometimes your facade alone is not sufficient. Um, and when it's not, sometimes you do things like this. Are they a little bit weird? I think they're a little bit weird, but they solve the problem without us having to touch like lots of downstream products. And sometimes a weird solution that works is actually a really great solution. Okay, cool. Well, now we must be done, right? We can get data in, we can get data out, kind of actually. Um, but there's one other piece of this that I wanna touch on because in my experience, we, okay. I said we started this in 2021, right? I'm gonna tell you the tr truth, we're not actually completely done yet. We're almost done, but we're not completely done yet. These things can take years. And when you're doing a migration over many years, usually someplace in the middle, somebody comes along with some requirement that you're like, well, I wasn't ready for that right now. That actually happened to us right at the very beginning. So you can see this is back to the picture where there's only that provider abstraction in the HR service. And at the time, we had, we had at least managed to get the new service stood up, but it didn't, it didn't do anything yet. Our partnerships team came to us and they're like, we're having this conversation with this HR provider. It's going really, really well. And as part of this relationship, we want to build a direct API integration to their stuff. Can it be done yesterday? Um, and in, 
given our lack of time machine, that was not a timeline that we felt we could make, but the business need was like as soon as humanly possible. So we had to decide what were we gonna do? Were we gonna have this be the very first thing we ever built in this new service that had done literally nothing ever in the history of the world when there was this important business need that was being you know, taken down to us? Or were we gonna go touch the legacy code that nobody in the whole world knew how it worked anymore when we had this pressing business need that was being brought down to us? There were trade-offs to both. In the end, we ended up implementing the new provider in the monolith. So we, we built, I'll, I'll say I built a not small amount of tech debt. Um, but with the best, it was the best we had to do at the time. But the funny thing about this story is that I don't know anything about partnerships or lawyers, but it's my understanding that there's like lots of paperwork and I don't know, really important people have to make decisions. The, in the end, the deadline slipped and we had enough time that we actually stood up the provider in the new service too. We never turned it on in the monolith ever. Like it sat there and we, we, I think we used it in sandbox like once to convince ourselves that it worked, but it never actually got turned on. Why am I even telling you this story? That's, that's a fantastic question. Other than to admit that sometimes I write tech debt. That's a fantastic question. When you're doing these multi-year migrations, and I did a very scientific study where I asked a handful of people I went to college with, and by that I mean like three, um, if they had used uh, Strangler Fig and how long it took, and everyone was like years. I'm like, okay, well, at least it's not just me, cool. Um, when that happens, you're probably gonna get these unexpected requirements, and then you're gonna have a decision to make. Are you gonna create some tech debt, or are you gonna try to stand it up in this new, in this new system? where the only correct answer is almost certainly going to be it depends. And sometimes you're gonna create some tech debt and that's gonna be okay. And sometimes you're gonna create some tech debt that in the end you actually never turn on for again, hashtag reasons. Those things are all fine and they happen as long as we're making like really conscious decisions when we're going to like embrace tech debt. I, I think it's super reasonable. Okay. Eventually we did get to the point where it was just like, like run the assembly line, you know, move the provider and do some testing. We eventually, because we did in fact actually have thousands of customers, we eventually augmented our staff tooling so that we could do bulk migrations as our confidence increased in our new system. I already, I already spoiled this one, so we must be done, right? It probably looks like this now, right? Not exactly. Uh, it looks closer. It looks like this approximately now. We don't have this like message bus total events thing completely figured out yet, but we still have some APIs that power our compensation product. Um, but we've made huge progress. Standing up new providers in the new service now is like days worth of work as opposed to like question mark works worth of work in our, in our previous implementation. Also, we got here just in time because our partnerships team is like, finding, we've implemented a bunch of new HR providers over the last couple of years. And I, I know for a fact we've been able to do it much more quickly in our new service than we would have been able to in our old one. But it's not exactly like the picture. And sometimes though, in the immortal words of Mick Jagger, you don't get what you want, you get what you need. That, this isn't the events driven thing that I had dreamed of in its totality, but it is a heck of a lot better than what we used to have. And we solved our customer confusion problem. It's no longer like, depending on the phase of the moon and which provider you have, what parts of your tools we support. Um, it just works. We do still have one integration running in the monolith, and I mean literally one. And actually, the team has been talking about trying to get it done before I do this talk. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know, it might be, we might actually be done uh, right now. I didn't get a chance to find out. And even though we aren't 100% done, or we might be as of like 45 minutes ago, I think that this entire process has been a really huge success because we did all of this work and our, our existing customers that we had to migrate, they never experienced any interruptions to their workflows. Like they were able to use our product the whole time. They actually never had to know that we changed the entire underpinning of everything that they relied on, like a, a giant magic trick. It, it was transparent to them. 
And I think that that is victory when we can upgrade our customers and they, and they, don't, they don't have to know. Okay, what did we learn? What went well? I wanna go back to this de-risking part because it's the part that I think is, is the most interesting. You, you could imagine maybe that the thing we did instead was like stand up the new system and implement literally all of the providers and in the morning one day move all of the traffic. Like I have anxiety just saying it out loud. Like move all of the traffic and hope for the best. And I, I just can't imagine a universe where that actually worked. Like it would have, something definitely would have broken. And my guess is so many things would have broken. It would have been almost unmanageable to try to deal with the fallout. This is why we wanted Strangler Fig. We wanted Strangler Fig because it allowed us this incremental change. And it was easy to reverse. When our end, like nobody wants to push code that's obviously broken, but we all break things, right? Like that's just part of doing our jobs. We wanted our engineers, and by our engineers, like I, I also as part of this team wanted to know that when I inevitably broke something for some customer in the new system, I could put them back to the old system and give myself the breathing room to fix it. That also made me feel like I could be more experimental and maybe, I don't know, take different types of risks in our new, in our new service than I would have been able to if I didn't have this safety net. The last thing we did was we instrumented this thing to the hilt because if it was gonna break, I'm sorry, when it was gonna break, we wanted to know it and we wanted to know it really fast. We had Slack notifications and century errors so that we could respond quickly when there was an issue. And we actually ended up expanding that migration tooling to also give us visibility into the health of all of our customers' integrations, which was something our old tools never provided to us. So in the end, that throwaway work it's actually gonna live on because we've expanded its utility beyond just that migration work. I really love that we moved thousands of customers and none of them had to know the difference and their stuff just worked. And even though it took a while, I think that this is a huge win and a really important reason to consider Strangler Fig because you have this optionality to keep functionality working for your customers. And though there is a tiny bit of legacy stuff still in the monolith, we've been able to delete the vast majority of it. And the other part about this implementation was when we got started, we actually had a conversation, the team had a conversation at the beginning of someday somebody, and it could be one of us or somebody else, is gonna be upgrading the code that we're getting ready to write right now. So how do we keep those future people in mind? Because the, you know, the life you save may be your own. Like how do you make sure that this thing has the sorts of modularity you need in order to upgrade it in the future? The last piece of this that I think is really interesting is if you, if you uh, like follow any, you know, like our, our CEO on, on LinkedIn or anything, you know that Carta loves a reorg, is like super into reorgs. The manage, there, I have a colleague who just lost it in the back and that's my favorite part of this whole situation. Um, so the manager on this team has changed, I honestly don't even know how many times, but we have continued to make progress. The work has actually never been abandoned. And I think that's because you can do this migration incrementally. The team doesn't have to like have the full totality of the history of the universe in order to understand how to continue this migration. And that means that we're able to make forward progress even when the team changes. It wasn't perfect. The long tail has, has been very long, like years long. I feel like I should mention in the interest of full transparency, when we put this together, I was like, oh, we'll be done in 18 months. Boy, she was a person that said things out loud. Um, it wasn't exactly, that was kind of a lousy estimate, but we're getting there. And I think that we're, you know, we're pretty close to some definition of complete. And this last thing is purely a Shauna thing. I wish we were more events driven. Like what's more events driven than like we hired a new person or like they got a raise or whatever that you get through an HR provider. I wish we were events, more events driven with this than we are right now, but we're actually making progress. And I think that we'll be much closer by the end of this year. So maybe you're wondering, huh, this thing that I'm considering doing, should I use Strangler Fig? That actually makes me think of a different question that a friend of mine asked me when I told him I was gonna do this talk. He's like, Shauna, when, I don't know, if you, this is washed out, this picture I commissioned from a friend of mine and if you can't see it, come find me afterwards because she made this amazing Strangler Fig that is in the Stranger Things like style. 
and I can't tell if you can see it. Anyway, when wouldn't you use Strangler Fig, Shauna? And I thought about it, and I was like, well, I probably wouldn't use it if I were like making a sandwich. It's probably not exactly the right tool for that job. But I admit to you, I live in a world where Strangler Fig is my hammer and the whole world looks like a nail. Like I, this is the thing that I go to more than just about any other pattern. But there are legitimate times not to leverage Strangler Fig. If you have like a super simple implementation, just, just don't bother. Just rewrite it in place or do, you know, do a one-time switch over. It's not worth the additional overhead for a sufficiently simple system. You might also be in a situation where your current implementation is so tightly coupled that you're like, identify independent modules, like I don't even know where to begin. In the, those are harder, and the correct answer is also, in those cases, it depends. Sometimes the right thing to do is to go in and actually introduce the seams in that legacy code so that you can then take it apart and leverage Strangler Fig. Sometimes that's gonna be the right thing to do. Sometimes the right thing to do will be like rewrite as much of it as you need in place and like pray for the next person that comes along to the code. It, it just depends on what your individual situation is. But I keep coming to, back to this pattern. I use it all the time and not just for decomposition. We're actually working on a project right now where we're recomposing some stuff into the monolith, which is a different fascinating story. But we're leveraging Strangler Fig for that work as well as we don't move things out into a new system, but we move things back in to our monolith. Now, if you want to use this pattern, you may come up against a few put, uh, pieces of pushback, and some of those came up in our conversation today. You know, this migration tool, it's just throwaway work, and it can be hard to convince leadership that that's something they should invest in. And when I am forced to convince leadership of something, I usually try to take a customer first lens, because they often are super motivated by the idea of having lots of happy customers and very few unhappy customers. The incremental migration gives you a way to ensure a working workflow for your existing customers, even in the midst of a migration. So this can be a good way to convince leadership to do this quote unquote, quote, throwaway work. Well, isn't it hard to reason about a system where part of it is in one place and part of it is in another? Yes, it, it is hard to reason about. This is where observability tooling is so important. Our staff tools did a lot of this for us. It doesn't have to be a tool that you just like build from the ground up though. Sometimes depending on your system, your existing observability tools will give you sufficient visibility into what's happening here. As long as you have some way to know what's going on, you can overcome this challenge. It's gonna to take too long. Well, they're not wrong there. Though I think at least it's getting done, right? I, I honestly think if we had tried to do this as like one big bang rewrite, we would have given up at some point because the number of failures would have just been become so like overwhelming that we would have the work would have been abandoned. So the only thing that's longer than I said 18 months and now it's been almost three years is if it took if it got done literally never. Sometimes I, I have a good friend of mine who I'm sure stole this from somewhere else who says uh, smooth is slow. No, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Uh, this is how this plays out in my experience, is that, yeah, it's, it's, it's slower, but in the end, you actually get the work done. The last thing that I've sometimes had pushback about is like introducing this facade, isn't that gonna make my stuff slower? Like now I've got this extra layer. And it's true, it's hard to add some additional logic to some existing functionality, like literally for free. That's not typically how computers work. But you can make your facades sufficiently simple that it is overhead that you can absorb. This is where you really want to make sure you have some amount of observability. You want to understand how much am I impacting my workflow with this introduction of the facade. Actually, I think I'm like way over time. I'm afraid I am, but four minutes. Oh, good. I'm running. That was exactly where I was trying to be after a computer debacle caused by Shauna. I want to close, I'm very eager for your questions, but I want to close with reiterating one more time how important I think Strangler Fig is in this idea of security for our engineers as they're doing their work. An engineer who feels that psychological safety of, if I break this, I know immediately how to remediate so that then I can go debug it, they will write better code. They will move faster they will make more innovations. And I feel pretty strongly that in the end, you will get a better product than you would have otherwise. And that is probably my favorite reason for using this pattern. 
Thank you all so much for coming. I'm so, I really appreciate it. I think we have a, a little time for maybe a couple of questions. Oh, I made a slide for that. It says Q&A. Thanks for that. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the simplified arrow you had between your new module and the monolith database? Oh. And the backwards compatibility piece too? Yeah. This guy. That guy? Yeah. Um, what we had some we had some choices of how we were going to decide to ensure that the tools that needed this data we did not have to go fundamentally rewrite because that that was like off the table i maybe i should have drawn the more complicated picture i can catch you afterwards and i can draw you the more complicated picture if you want the high level idea is that we introduced a new endpoint into the monolith that was able to accept this data from the hr service and put it into the database exactly the way stakeholder was expecting it. Like the, from, from this module's, I have a pointer. From this module's perspective, everything was the same. And the way we made that happen was by giving ourselves a path to get the data into the monolith database via the existing monolith, but not existing monolith code. We, had to, we did have to write some new code in the monolith. It was fairly lightweight, like in the, I, I, I kind of hate on this arrow, like it did something to me. It's not the worst thing in the world, it's just like, it's not my favorite. It's not the thing I was hoping to do. I have no idea if I answered your question, but I'd be glad to draw you the more helpful diagram later. Maybe one more question. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm curious how you were able to um, convince leadership, given that uh, with this approach, is generally like a long-term um, commitment in into doing this migration rather than just uh, working on the on a legacy system, including the fact that uh, at least for that new um, provider, you you started with that, right? So, like, what was the key point to to be able to to use this? We had a few different angles that we took, but all of them were were customer focused. We had a high degree of confidence that we were going to be able to design a system that in the future allowed us to more quickly integrate new providers, which had recently become a thing that our customers were asking for more. That helped a lot because the existing code was, had just grown so organically, we did not have a nice way to just like plug in a new thing. We also were quite confident we could make our data syncs faster, and that was another common customer complaint, was just like, why is my data old? And it was because we didn't really know how that code worked. Um, and I think it also had like, we all have this problem, right? It gets slower over time, nothing gets accidentally faster over time. The, the customer first part was what we really leaned into, and the other kind of bonus piece of this was, at the time, our CTO was, uh, we had a different CTO who was like, if you can build outside the monolith, build outside the monolith. So when I showed him a picture with a decomposed service, he was like, yeah, go build that, which I also leaned into. That would probably not be what would happen at Carta now, but it was what happened at Carta then. Gotcha, thank you. Thank you, and Shona, you will be available. I will absolutely break. be around, yes, thank you yes, so much. absolutely.